uh, we'll be beginning a series in the book of Ephesians. And uh, we're going to spend some time there. And one of the reasons is, as I, this is not a new church, and I've been a pastor for a while, um, we are coming together for the first time. Um, and yes, I've been here a couple of times, but this is now a sustained time period where, as pastor and congregation, uh, we're coming together in a new way. And so I really wanted to begin with uh, the foundation of what is the gospel. And Ephesians does that so well of not just what did Jesus do for you and for me, but how does that affect absolutely every aspect of all creation and of our lives. Uh, now, in the early days of you know, graduating seminary, which was for a long, you know, a long time ago for me, uh, I think we would come out with sort of this sense that a new pastor would come, you'd preach the sermon, that would fix all the problems of the church, and uh, I don't know what we expected to do after that, but uh, I am blessed to come and know that you have received faithful shepherding over the years, that you have heard the gospel, that uh, even those who have visited have, have proclaimed the Lord's word well. And yet, we are coming together in a new way, and so Ephesians will be our starting place. Now, one of the other things I'll be doing is uh, kind of uh, breaking that up or balancing it out or uh, however you want to look at it, is that every fourth or fifth Sunday of the month, uh, we're going to take a little jump back to the Old Testament. And uh, that will be a series on the book of Daniel. And Daniel is a book that is very dear to my own heart and very appropriate for uh, a church that is in a time period where culture is moving uh, more secular, more pagan. And of course, Daniel lived in a very pagan world, as did Paul. But uh, there are some really wonderful things uh, that we'll, we'll be reading and uh, I'll be preaching on there. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's pray and then uh, we'll read together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word that you gave to Paul, to the Ephesians, and to us. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes that we might see, open our ears that we might hear and respond. Lord, may the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, and may your church be built up. May you meet all of us personally. May your spirit work powerfully in all of us. And above all, we pray that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6, really focusing on verses 3 through 6 today. Uh, but I'll be reading through verse 14 because, uh, and you may know this already, uh, Paul wrote a long sentence. And it starts in verse 3, and it goes all the way to verse 14, and it is a wonderful, uh, as, as Rick called it in a conversation, a fire hose of blessing. And uh, it really is just this wonderful pouring out of praise to God and blessing that he's given to us. And so, let's read the scriptures together. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that, we might, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is God's word. Well, we begin here in the book of Ephesians. And in the first couple of words, uh, already scholars have uh, really attacked or critiqued uh, the book of Ephesians. Most secular scholars or even kind of liberal scholars don't really believe Paul wrote this letter. I've studied that a lot. There's a lot that could be said. I'm just going to say it quickly. Their arguments are things like it reads too, too much like Paul to be Paul. Terrible argument. Um, now there's also a a stronger argument that this may not have been written to the Ephesians, and some of you may have a Bible that has a footnote that says the earliest uh, Greek manuscripts don't have the words in Ephesus. That's another one that I don't think is all that important. If Paul wrote in Ephesus, then it's the word of God. Uh, just about all of the early church and uh, many others say it was written to the Ephesians. At worst, if worst is the right word, the Ephesians were one of many churches that received it. So I want to put that all forward and say we affirm that this is the word of God for us. The good news is that what comes after, we don't have nearly that level of contention, and, uh, and we can now move in uh, to the text that we have before us. I usually steer clear of politics in the pulpit, but there was a moment that came to mind that sort of summarizes some of the issues of what's going on in the book of Ephesians. Now, at the, you know, I'm risking this, but I'm also risking this knowing that this happened in 1992 and that uh, that's probably far gone enough that any any wounds or uh, you know, sore spots have healed. But around 31 years ago, there was a debate. And I remember this as a young man. Vice Admiral Stockdale, who was part of the Perot campaign, was asked for his opening statement. I wonder if any of you remember how he responded. His words that followed were seized upon out of context completely. And if you listen to what comes next, it's fairly articulate. But this, these words in a pre-Twitter world were grabbed on and held tightly to his words, who am I and why am I here? Well, as it turns out, those are fantastic questions. As uh, we look at our own lives, as we look at the book of Ephesians, and as much as it was true then uh, in those debates, it's much more true for us that it's crucial for us to understand who we are and why we're here. Now, I began by saying that you know, some scholars are not convinced that this was written to the Ephesians. But certainly, it made its way to Ephesus for sure. And I'm pretty convinced that there's no good reason to think 
that it wasn't written to the Ephesians. Ephesians, or Ephesus was a city that was very dear to Paul. He spent two years there. Um, and as was true of many of the other cities that Paul visited, it was a very pagan place. Uh, you may remember the near riot in Acts 19 where Demetrius stirred up the people against Paul because he was afraid of the gospel taking root and of a loss of profit in his idol, uh, idol production, uh, making these little silver idols. They were a, a church surrounded by a sinful, idolatrous society chasing after the things of the world. And that description could very easily apply to us today with the exception of maybe the, the silver idols. Do we understand who we are? Do you understand who you are? Do you understand where you've come from, where you are now, where you are going? Or put another way, do you hold to your identity as God names you? Or do you hold to your identity as sort of something that you've managed to cobble together and you judge yourself on what you've done in the last 24 hours or maybe last couple of weeks and think, well, I've done well in the last day or two. God must have favor for me. Or I've done poorly. God must be greatly disappointed and, and look on me with a scowl. Well, as we look at Ephesians, we're going to see that our identity is rooted in a phrase that happens over and over and over in the book of Ephesians. And this phrase, in Christ. I love how one, uh, one commentator summarized the, uh, the central message of the book of Ephesians. It's a bit of a mouthful. Cosmic reconciliation and unity in Christ are the central message of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. What does that mean? Cosmic reconciliation and unity in Christ are the central message of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Put plainly, the book of Ephesians is about Christ bringing everything together under his rule and about bringing us into that as individuals and as a church. And so as we read, we're going to see that play out in every aspect. We're going to see it in the grand scope of history, and we're going to see it all the way down to things like, how do you treat your wife? How do you treat your husband? How do you treat your boss? Uh, and things like that. And so as we begin this series, I look for that idea of, of being in Christ, of things being brought together and uh, really brought under the rule of Christ. That's a bit of a long introduction, but uh, I hope a helpful one. And as we, we start our text today, we really begin with this idea that God is blessing us. When we look at the uh, first couple words of Ephesians, uh, we begin with praise. We begin with grace. We begin with peace. Paul is not writing this to a church that God is done with or even a church that is in need of radical correction. Uh, Paul comes to this church, and what he says is gracious and kind. And it's not to say the Ephesians didn't need some correction, but this is a book that is filled with grace and God's love and with joy. Well, after Paul introduces uh, his work, after he greets them, uh, we begin with blessing. 
again. Uh, and we begin with Paul blessing God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, here, God is blessed because of the ways that he blesses us. And that long sentence is filled with blessing, filled with many ways that God has blessed us over and over and over. And we see that as we unpack this, there is a dance between God and us, where God blesses us, and then we bless God. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. And likely that's a little bit like what uh, the Trinity does, where God, uh, within the Trinity, the Father glorifies the Son, the Son glorifies the Father, the Spirit glorifies them both, and so on and so on. And a little bit like what the new heavens and the new earth will be like, where we are in the presence of God, where we glorify him, where uh, we participate in the kingdom of God. Well, this is something that, as we go, will be unpacked in the book of Ephesians. And uh, as we go, we're going to see that the, the words of this big, long sentence are going to be unpacked, developed, and uh, brought into fuller and uh, a richer, uh, con uh, a, we'll, we will receive a fuller and richer understanding of the gospel. I mentioned that I wanted to jump into verses 3 and following, and one of the reasons why is because I'm so excited about what is present here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? It says, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in him. So right away, we're starting out with some really big ideas and some very uh, powerful, wonderful expressions of what God has done for us. And Paul says that God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's quite a statement. Uh, and uh, some have argued that when we see spiritual here, our kind of our English understanding of spiritual as spiritual versus physical may not be quite what Paul means here but rather spiritual in the sense of of the Spirit. And so what Paul is saying is that he has blessed us in Christ with every blessing of the Spirit in the heavenly places. Now, in the heavenly places is important. Uh, we live in a place where Christians, who, as we're going to see later, are heirs of God and heirs of all things, have to deal with things like inflation. And it's not easy. And there are times when we look at our electric bill and we say, oh my, how am I going to deal with this? And there are times when someone crashes into our car or we crash into someone's car. Or you're setting up insurance and you find out that little fender bender is going to cost you that you had a year ago. Um, our blessings at least right now, are in the spiritual realm, in the, uh, in the heavenly places. But the physical will come later. But Paul says that he has blessed us with every blessing of the Spirit or every sp spiritual gift. And what that means is nothing is lacking. There's another way to say what David says. The Lord is my shepherd, and I lack nothing. That's an easy thing to say, and it's a very difficult thing to internalize. We have every blessing in Christ in the heavenly realms. Now, as we unpack this, we're going to see how deep this goes and how rich it is. But 
in our everyday life, it's very easy to just think of, okay, I've been given the gospel, I've been forgiven, and now I'm just going to sort of do my thing. And we may not say that you know, expressed. Uh, we may not, you know, if we were writing our confession, we may not write that down, that I believe the gospel is something that, oh, happened back there and doesn't really affect me now. But how quickly we divert to that sort of default of, well, I've got to make things work in my own life. And God, sure, he saved me from my sins, but it's sort of up to me to get things done. Well, that, of course, is not the message of the scriptures. The message of the scriptures is that you have been blessed with every spiritual gift in Christ. That the only thing we really lack is the physical presence of Christ, which, yes, that's a big thing, but we have far more blessing than we admit to ourselves. And if we were able to hold on to that, we would be much more joyful. Well, as well as being blessed in Christ, Paul says we have been chosen in Christ. Uh, he says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, this issue of predestination is something that often we treat very academically. And we sort of set aside our understanding of Jesus and of God the Father as loving and kind. And we kind of set ourselves more in the mindset of a philosophy class or kind of a discussion where lots of people are kind of sitting there stroking their beards and looking ponderous. And, uh, and in doing that, I think there are good, very good questions. But often, we tend to focus really only on questions of free will versus determinism or kind of free will versus God's sovereignty, which again, those are great discussions, I, and I love having them. I once had a ninth grade class uh, that was studying theology, and about every other class, they wanted to revisit the topic of free will and God's sovereignty, and they loved it and they wanted to do that for a whole year, um, which was good. But, but this is not how Paul is treating predestination. Uh, that is, God's choice of who will be saved. He just sort of drops it into our lap and moves on. And what's more, he's really excited about it. And as much as this is an academic topic, it's often a very charged topic for us as well. Uh, very often, we as Americans hear something like, God is in control, and for a, you know, a group of people where our highest, uh, our highest national virtue really is probably liberty. I think a good case could be made for that, and liberty almost at all costs. And so the idea that God would, would have anything to do with my decisions, well, that's offensive. Who is God to make choices for me? And then you realize, well, what? Who is God? God is God. And then I recommend read the book of Job. Read Romans 9. Look at, look at the life of Jonah, uh, who he wanted to make his own decisions, and God had better ones. Um, now, again, free will and predestination, it's an important topic, so I don't want you to think I'm sort of just glossing over that and I don't care about it. But when it comes to what Paul is doing, Paul is just assuming it and stating it. And he never really defends it. Um, in Romans 9, he sort of does, but not, not fully. And again, when Job questions God, and God shows up. Uh, that question, who are you, God, to do this? Oh, oh, oh. 
you're God. I read about you. Now I see you, and I'm just going to be quiet because I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so Paul, when he's talking about predestination, of God's choice of you who believe, he's excited. He's joyful. And it's linked to the love of God, not to some cold, calculating choice that has no warmth in it. This is good news. Now, if it seems difficult to grasp, uh, there's another, I think, clue that, yes, this is difficult. And two, it, at least for me personally, is helpful in understanding this. When did God choose us? Well, in verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. God is eternal. This is not a choice that happened in time. God didn't, as some have suggested, look ahead and see a choice that we make and then say, okay, Pastor Brandon, he chose me, so okay, I'll choose him. This happened before creation. Well, how does that work? I don't know. The best answer I have is that God is eternal. And Eternal doesn't just mean no beginning and no end. Uh, that's part of it. But God is also outside time. Time is a creation of God. Uh, I believe it's C.S. Lewis in his Mere Christianity has the illustration of a line on a piece of paper, and you and I are on that line, and we move in one direction. God wrote the line. He can put his whole hand on it. He can touch it in more than one place. He can turn it sideways and look at it as a single point. He can revisit it whenever he wants. Or another way to think about this is imagine you have a three-dimensional person. Imagine it's you. And you visit a two-dimensional world. A two-dimensional world is a flat drawing. Now your job is to explain the concept of a cone. Easy, right? Well, it's like a triangle. Oh, so a cone is a triangle. No, well, no, it's, it's round on top. OK, so it's a circle. No, uh, no, no, no. Uh, it's not round on the top that way. You turn it sideways, and, and then you look at it, and it looks like a circle. But the other end is pointy. So it's a little point and a circle at the same time, but you said it was a triangle. Uh, OK, well, let me try this again. Uh, it's, not one sh it's not two shapes. It's one shape. And the diameter of the circle increases as you move from the bottom to the top, but the sides are a triangle. Now, your flat stick figure is looking at you saying, I know what a triangle is, and I know what a circle is, and they're different. How can those be the same? My point is really, God is far beyond us. And so when it comes to things like this, God's eterna uh, eternality, God's transcendence, mean that we are sometimes going to struggle with things that God talks about and reveals to us. And he's revealing them to us in a true way, but he's revealing them to us in our language. And so there are going to be times when we will struggle because what God does is far beyond us. Isaiah 55, 9, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now another thing we're going to see about God's choice is if it's done before the foundation of the world, it doesn't depend on us. Uh, we sometimes call this unconditional election. And again, we need to be careful to remember that we're talking about a God who is love. And as we read, tail end of verse 4 and verse 5, in love he predestined us. But what this means is God chooses you 
for, other re for reasons other than who you are or what you've done. This is not that we have done such a good job of following God that he says, all right, you have, you have made it. You have done the right things, and so I'm going to let you into my kingdom and into my family. Instead, uh, God looks at us, and he sees people who are sinful, who are rebellious, and he says, I'm going to choose you anyway. And uh, in speaking of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, uh, there's a passage uh, in Deuteronomy. I believe it's Deuteronomy 7. I don't have the text in front of me. But God says this to them. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It is not because you were more in number than any of the other people that God set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out of a, with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now here, what is God saying? Israel, I didn't pick you because you were so impressive. The Hittites, they are impressive. The Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans. The Israelites, at least at their beginning. They don't even have metal tools for a while. Uh, but God is with them. Why does he choose them? Because they were so wonderful? Read the Old Testament, uh, and if you start with the book of Exodus, and just start with the best part where they come out of the land of Egypt. They're not slaves anymore. God has just brought them to the Red Sea. They've seen miracles. They've seen the Red Sea part, and what do they do? They complain, and then they complain some more, and they complain some more. And what does God do? He loves them. And are we any different? No. Uh, or if we are, it's only because the Spirit of God is at work in us, and that is a gift in itself, as we'll see later. So why did God choose them? Uh, because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. God didn't choose you because you did something wonderful. He didn't choose me for that reason. He chose us because he is wonderful, because he is loving. And this is the same grace that we'll see sort of play out. I have an illustration that I like to use with my, you know, when I was teaching students, that when we go to pick a puppy, at least in the old days, you went someone had a barn, and you'd go to the barn, there's a box of puppies. Uh, it's more complicated for most people now, but that may still happen. I hope it does. Uh, but you go, and you see this box of puppies. How do you pick the puppy? And unless you're trying to stump the teacher, um, if we're honest, we all have conditions. Some of us are looking for the kindest, sweetest little puppy that comes up and nuzzles us when we stick our hand in. Some of us are looking for the strongest. Others might have a special place for the little runt. And we like to think that when God looked at us, he saw something wonderful. But biblically, we're all ugly, snarling puppies that bite the hand of the one who's come to choose us. And if you follow it out scripturally, really, we're dead in sin. Uh, it's not a pretty picture. And yet, God, who is rich in mercy, chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Wow, what did he choose us to? We were chosen 
to adoption, for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. This is where it gets even more amazing. We are brought in to Christ's family. You who are not a people, book of Hosea, are now a people. Those of us who were, well, all of us who were estranged from God are now brought in. And the gospel is not that God did what he said he might do to the uh, Israelites. You remember after, uh, after a certain point, God says, all right, Moses, these people have rebelled enough. I'll take care of all your enemies. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you guys, and I'm going to send you on your way. And I'm not going to go with you because... You all are rebellious, and I'm not going to be able to be there without you calling judgment on yourself. So go ahead, go, and be well in the land of Canaan. And what does Moses say? Well, if you don't go with us, that's it. God, come with us. God doesn't do that. He doesn't say, I'm going to save you, and then you'll be on your own. Nor does he say, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to get you back to that starting point, and now you can work your way back in. He brings us into his family. Being adopted by God means we are not alone. It means we have a heavenly father. But even more than that, really at the core of this idea of adoption here, is not just being brought into a family. We are being brought in as sons through Jesus Christ. Now, there's a way that it's appropriate to say sons or daughters, but if you understand the inheritance rights of the Roman world, there is a particular blessing to being the son. And what we find is that Paul is saying, you have been adopted by God with the sort of firstborn son status. You are going to be the heir. Do you know the name Gaius Octavius or Octavian? He was a young man from a, a noble family in Rome, and a well-off enough family, uh, but he would have likely been a minor footnote in history, except he was adopted. He was adopted by his uncle, Gaius Julius Caesar. And from the moment of his adoption, he became heir to Caesar's wealth, his clients, his prestige, the loyalty of his legions. And by the way, looked up how wealthy was Julius Caesar. By some estimates, $500, uh, $500 billion. Um, his clients, those are people who come to you and give you money so that you will like them. His prestige, you'd walk into a room and be the most important person instantly. The legions meant he was one of the most powerful people on earth at the time. In Christ, you have been adopted as a son, or again, as a daughter, by someone far greater than Caesar. And the text we read earlier Romans 8, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit 
himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Well, what does this mean for us? It means that if we are chosen, if we are adopted, we have amazing security in Christ. As Romans 8 continues, if God is for us, who can be against us? If our status on, as Christians depended on us and our accomplishments, then it could easily follow that it would be up to us to maintain our status as Christians and that we could very easily lose it. But it was established before the creation of the world. Now, by the way, again, that doesn't mean that we don't have a choice. It doesn't mean that we don't have wills. It doesn't mean that uh, we're saved by something other than our faith. In order to become a Christian, it's not that God chose, chooses you and you sort of sit back and, well, God chose me. I'm a Christian now. No, that's going to work through our heart, and we are going to believe and that's going to produce fruit, and we're going to see God at work. But before it was ever our choice to follow God, it was God's choice that he would choose us. Another result is belonging. You are not alone. You will never be alone. There is never a moment where you will be judged based on what you are most ashamed of or most guilty of, because Jesus has taken that, and he has brought you into his family. And there's a wonderful song that uh, I was reminded of a couple of months ago. I will change your name. You will no longer be called wounded, outcast, lonely, or afraid. I, God changes our full identity, and you are now a people who belong to him, who have his favor, who are part of the body of Christ, where God's name is on you, and you are his precious child. Another re result, uh, result should be humility. There's a temptation in this to be proud of who we've become. Richer than Caesar, you say. That sounds pretty good. Uh, I've been cleansed of all my sin. Well, that must be pretty good. Um, if we understand, as Paul will say in the next chapter, that this is a gift that has nothing to do with us, then we should be the most humble of all people. If we were part of obtaining it, then we could say, well, I worked hard to get where I am. I worked hard to become an heir of Christ. No. Jesus worked hard. And that was given to me as a free gift. And that means I have no room for boasting, no room for competitiveness, no room uh, to judge another in the sense of, well, I'm better than you. Instead, grace alone should also make us very patient or long-suffering. We have an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, and it is certain. I want you to imagine that everyone you know, or just about, just about everyone you know, is going to Bass Lake for the weekend. There's going to be a big party, and you can't go. You're stuck at work, or have to water the garden, or, or can't afford it, or something like that. How do you feel? Probably not great. But then imagine that the reason is not that it's work or duty or something. But you can't go because you need to get on a flight the next day. Where are you going? You're flying to Italy, where you're going to spend some time in Rome, and then you're going to go on a Mediterranean cruise for a month with your very dearest 
friends and relatives. How are you going to feel? Are you going to stay home and feel terrible that you can't go to the lake? Oh, well, you might be bummed you don't get to see some people, but your main focus? I'm going to be eating in Rome in a couple of days. I'm going to be walking on Roman roads, and then I'm going to sail around on the Mediterranean, go to Greek islands, and see just beautiful buildings and beauty and baklava and a little fried fish. And how much more should we not be filled with joy and expectation that though there are things in this life that we miss out on, things that we have to suffer, we have the certainty of inheritance. And nothing can take that away from us. And it means that, yes, we're going to miss out. I used to tell my students when I was in the classroom, there are waves breaking on the North Shore right now that I am not surfing. And I, you know, I suppose I could be. Not really. I, I was never that good. Uh, I don't care. Why? Because there's a new heavens and a new earth. And there are going to be waves there, I think. It's tough to say. Is this, you know, there's a sea of crystal. There's no sea. We're in metaphor and revelation. So <laughs> what's going on there? I don't know. But there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, and it's going to be amazing. And Jesus is going to be there. And so all the tears, all the pain will be wiped away. And if we understand that, it's going to work its way deep into our hearts and give us a joy that cannot be shaken. But in conclusion, we're only like you know, a third of the way through Paul's sentence, but uh, at least our text, verse 6, what is all this for? To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Where does all this take us? It takes us to praise. We are brought into Christ's kingdom, his glorious purpose, uh, and we're brought there so that we can praise Jesus. And then he's going to bless us. And so may that be how we live. May that be how our week goes. May we encourage each other uh, to live that way. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, give us an understanding of what you've done for us. Give us an understanding of the joy we have in you, of the blessings you've given us. Help us to believe and have life. In Jesus' name. Amen.